So you can take it away from here, Mike. All right. Thank you, Mac. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Um, today, we're continuing uh, day one of the 2022 Invasive Species Forum. We hope that you're enjoying the uh, session so far. My name is Michael Rogers. I'm the Research and Strategy Coordinator at the Invasive Species Center, and I'll be your moderator for this session, which is about risks, impacts, and innovative solutions. I would encourage you, if you have any questions, please use the uh, Q&A feature rather than the chat to address questions to our speakers, and I'll do my best to bring them up. If there's any late questions coming in, then um, we'll try to address those as well. I've encouraged the speakers to be active there and to provide uh, information that would allow you to further communicate with them as well. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to our first speaker, which is uh, Dr. Amanda Rowe. So if you want to uh, come on screen, um, Dr. Rowe, and share your share your screen, um, then I'll give you a little introduction here. Okay. okay, so Dr. Amanda Rowe is a research scientist with Natural Resources Canada at the Great Lakes Forestry Center in Sault Ste. Marie. She's been working on forest pests since her PhD at the University of Alberta. In 2016, she joined the Insect Production and Quarantine Lab, IPQL, um, which is a world-class facility funded as a national service within the CFS to produce insects for research. Dr. Rowe integrates um, organismal, ecological, and genomic data to identify insect pests define population structures and characterize functional differences that underlie forest insect diversity, dynamics, and risks. As lead of the IPQL, Dr. Rowe contributes to the living infrastructure to support scientific research on native and invasive forest insect pests. And with that, the floor is yours. There we go. I couldn't find my unmute button. Great. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present some of the work that I've been doing with a much larger group of, of researchers. And the this organization or this group is called uh, the Biosurveillance of Alien Forest Enemies or Biosafe. Biosafe was an initiative that was began uh, with a Genome Canada funded grant to develop tools that will allow us to to track and predict risk of high risk uh, invasive species. And we really focused on four main species within forest, uh, forest invasives. And we wanted to use the wealth of knowledge contained within the genomics of these invasive species and to translate that information into knowledge that will help us respond to uh, new invasives and to help prevent further invasions into Canada's forests. As I mentioned, this is a large group and I just want to highlight the, the number of institutions and people that have been involved with this since it was initially funded uh, six years ago. And so you can see we have a, a combination of both academics and uh, government and not-for-profit organizations that have been working together to try and develop these tools to help us respond to invasive species. And genomics is an, a, a way of accessing this knowledge contained within an organism to help us understand that process of invasion. An invasion is a very dynamic, complex process that can be sort of broken down into a series of steps. And it can help us to identify things like the source, the original native range of, uh, of an invasive species, the pathway that it follows, and to identify variants within a population of invasives that may pose greater risks based on their functional traits. The genomics that we look at can also provide insight into these, these types of traits. And that could be host range, flight ability, cold tolerance. And we can use that those genomic signatures to develop tools to read those, uh, those little signatures within uh, an insect's genome to be able to improve our surveillance of that invasive species. 
our, our, our group focused on four, uh, four pests, two insects and uh, two pathogens. So the Asian longhorn beetle and Lymantria dispar are the insects, as well as Dutch elm disease and sudden oak death. For the rest of this talk, I'm really going to focus on uh, Lymantria dispar. This is a species that was formerly known as gypsy moth, but for the rest of the talk, I will be referring to it with its uh, scientific name. So Lymantria dispar is really a complex of, uh, of species and populations. And the uh, anyone who was in Southern Ontario this year experienced um, a pretty large outbreak of the species. And the, the subspecies that we were experiencing in Southern Ontario are, uh, pop, is a population we suspect is of European origin. And this is referred to as Lymantria dispar dispar. And the important part with this is that the females are flightless. And so you can actually see here on uh, the, the right hand side, uh, this is a trap that we might use to be able to, to monitor for population levels. It works really well. We can collect a lot of males, which are what you see here in brown. But then we also see here in white, this is the female. And the female, even though she has really large wings, she actually is flightless. And so she will mate and then lay an egg mass on a tree and, uh, and then die. The another sort of population or biotype or subspecies within Lymantria dispar is Lymantria dispar asiatica. This is a, a group of populations that are of Asian origin. The, the troubling part with this uh, subspecies is that the females have the ability to fly. And that ability to fly actually increases the risk of spread. And we've really had the opportunity in Eastern North America of limiting the spread of uh, uh, Lymantria dispar dispar by containing those populations and it really is hinging on the fact that those females can't fly because the uh, the, the Asiatica subspecies can fly it poses a much greater risk as well the host plants that these two different subspecies prefer are different so the eastern what we the populations in eastern Canada and North America prefer mostly hardwood, so things like oak and maple, and that's what you would have been seeing on uh, where you'd be seeing them during the outbreaks this year. But the Lymantria dispar asiatica has a much broader host range and includes conifers. So this subspecies does pose a much greater risk than the population and subspecies that we have already established in North America. And so what we want to do from a surveillance perspective is be able to identify whether the intercepted organisms, such as ones collected in a trap or intercepted on shipping containers, are of European origin or of Asian origin. Now, insects have, um, have fairly large genomes. And a large genome means there's just a lot of information you have to sift through to be able to get to the information that you're really interested in, such as their source or whether they're able to fly or their host uh, preferences. And because of the size of these genomes, we have to either take a random approach where we randomly chop up the genome and hope we find specific parts that are going to give us the information we're looking for, or use a more target approach where we focus on very specific genes that we're interested in. So the work I'm going to present here is uh, work that has been done by Sandrine Peek, who is a research scientist with Natural Resources Canada, and she's based out of the Laurentian Forestry Center in Quebec City. And so her work is taking a, that random approach. And so taking the genome, chopping it up, and randomly sampling information spread across the entire genome. And by spreading it across, what you're hoping is that, or what we hope is that we can, we are able to sample enough variation to be able to see distinct signatures of the different places and the different populations that were sampled. And what you can see here is we have a map of all of the samples that were collected and genotyped by Sandrine and her supervisor, Michelle Cousson. And all of the locations are color coded. Um, 
here in this map. So you can see we have our North American samples of Lymantria dispar, both in Canada and in North America, forming a cluster. And the map that I'm showing you here with all these little dots is called a principal coordinate analysis. And what this does is it takes all of that information from a genome and all of that different variation and reduces that down to two principal component axes. And so this is a, a, a variation reduction process to really show the most important variation that's being contained within that genome. And then if you look, we can see here on, uh, on the map uh, all of the different countries that were sampled through uh, Europe, uh, North Africa, and then through to uh, the rest of the Palearctic and countries within Asia. And what we see is that the genomic variation separates from North America to the rest of the uh, continent, uh, the Eurasian continent. And then we also see an east-west gradient separating those European subspecies from those Asian subspecies. But it isn't a distinct break. There really is a continuous decline of variation. And if you take those principal coordinate axes and add a third, you can actually see in Asia, there's a separation among the different countries from Asia, China, and Japan. So what we're seeing is that there is a distinct genetic signature of the location that these different populations are coming from. And with this information, we can actually define distinct populations. And each of these bubbles around these collecting localities are defining these distinct locations within the uh, Eurasian and North American uh, populations. But if we want to try and operationalize something like this and to take that variation that we're seeing from a genome-wide perspective, what we want to do is we want to be able to identify the specific markers that are going to give us the most information possible with the least number of markers necessary, because we can't fully sample the genome of every single individual that might be intercepted uh, by uh, inspectors uh, with the CFIA. And so what we did and what Sandrine did is she looked at the SNPs or these are single nucleotide polymorphisms or just think of them as markers, locations in the genome. And she identified the 200 most informative markers. And with those, we can maintain a very high assignment su uh, success for assigning an unknown sample back to its population of origin. And so what this means is if we use these 200 markers and screen an unknown sample, we'll have very high certainty where that sample came from based on those previously defined populations. But what we want to do is we want to be able to take those markers and design what's called a targeted enrichment tool. And it's taking those markers and developing markers within a single, say, or a single assay that will give us information for all of these four pieces. We would like to be able to have a confident identification of the taxon. So is this Lymantria dispar dispar or Lymantria dispar asiatica, or is it another Lymantria species that has been intercepted? Do we see evidence of hybridization or gene flow? So hybridization is when two very distinct populations or subspecies may have interbred. Are we able to identify the location or the origin of that sample, as we see here? And then finally, can we infer a functional trait based on those markers? I hadn't presented any data about this, but for uh, Lymantria dispar, what we're interested in is, can we find genomic markers that will predict whether the females are capable of flight? And what we can do is if we have all of these targeted gene regions, we can pool those into a single assay and then screen individuals with this, uh, with this tool. 
And the tool we've called is LimeSeq, and it's using a reduction process through enrichment. And this is that targeted approach. And what we've done is we've demonstrated with these targeted tools, with these targeted markers, we can achieve greater than 90% accuracy in the uh, assignment success for those specific parts with um, LimeSeq, and it's comparable to the information and the results we obtained with our genotyping by sequencing approach, which is that broader genome survey. And what you see here is that LimeSeq data presented again on a PCA, and you see that your samples are grouping into specific locations. And so we have predefined populations based on locations that are spread across uh, North, both North America and the world. And then we have these open circle Xs that are crossing, uh, that, that fall within these sort of predefined locations. So these clusters of individuals that were intercepted in Canada associate very closely with samples that were derived from Japan in our initial survey. And likewise, we see here, these interceptions were found from, uh, were associating most closely with individuals that were sampled initially in uh, South Korea. And I think finally we have another one here where we have a couple individuals that were coming out of, uh, sample, or associating with sources in China. We also see that most of these populations here, which are our European uh, populations, so this would be the Lymantria dispar dispar, the flightless individuals, we don't actually see any interceptions here. And so this gives us a couple pieces of information. We have identified uh, specific locations in the world where we are seeing individual uh, pathway, we see pathways from specific parts of the world for our intercepted samples. And we can also see that these are the locations of Lymantria dispar asiatica. So these are the individuals that could have flight capacity and flight capabilities of, uh, for, for their females. And so these are would be considered high risk relative to um, uh, interceptions that might be coming from uh, of a European origin. And what's really neat is that this tool actually can be used on uh, uh, within the field. And it is uh, has a very uh, low cost relative to a whole genome approach. And it can be done directly on samples sampled right off of uh, out, out of traps. And so an individual sample might cost about $20. And since it is high throughput, it can work really well for large surveys. And we have the abilities of pooling reactions and taking a mix and match approach for small numbers of samples. And the really nice thing, and for anyone who's done any sort of genomics work, is it has a very simple, it's very simple from a bioinformatics perspective. And it does. It can be done on a single laptop, and you don't need to have the really large supercomputing capacity to be able to analyze these data. So all of these really lend themselves to applications you directly by the end user, and that is really important for a lot of these genomic tools. Is to um, is to sort of release it out of the lab and make it much more accessible from within a field uh, perspective. So where are we going forward? We really want to move towards um, uh, open access data where we can provide the tools to end users, provide opportunities for real-time surveillance, and to be able to upload user data and to share this among users and develop these standardized tools, which will allow a much more integrated uh, uh, collection of information. And so with that, I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rowe. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the Q&A, but I do have a couple of questions of my own. Okay. Um, so I, I could see a tool like this being super valuable for 
uh, chipping away at some of the bottlenecks for, like you talked about, accessibility of data, and as far as the um, technical analysis needed to give you your answers, mm -hmm. um, which I imagine that that is a current bottleneck right now. But I'm hoping you can talk to whether there are other bottlenecks as far as uh, sampling rigor or as far as um, having skilled workers to be able to perform this type of work or coordination. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so one of one of the the so the, the overall uh, plan or scope of the the BioSafe initiative was to develop these tools and actually have them uh, tested so that they could be used in multiple labs ac across organizations and even across um, from an even from an international perspective. And having having people to be able to do that that initial testing and to try and sort of fully operationalize that work. It is, um, it is still a work in progress and there are still, path, like we still are along, we're still following along on this path. And like anything from science, it always takes a lot longer than you expect um, and then throw a pandemic on top of that. Uh, but the, the bottleneck too is having people boots on the ground finding those samples that need to be in like those intercepted samples with the amount of trade that is going on between countries and that trade is is increasing every year there's constant pressure from invasive species and being able to effectively um, surveil all of the goods that are coming in or all of the ships in the harbors to find these potential uh, invasives and to, 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 to watch these high risk pathways. That's where I think the, the biggest bottleneck is, is, is just being able to prevent and this is to, to identify the, the high risk pathways and to, to have enough surveillance on the ground to be able to provide material for these tools. And that boots on the ground surveillance is expensive. And because it's based on a person, it's very difficult to, to, to reduce that cost. That makes a lot of sense to me. And thank you for, for laying that out. It, it's a, I mean, it's a tough question to address, honestly. Um, I do have one question from the audience here. Um, they're curious whether there's been any occurrences of Lumatria dispar asiatica in Canada, I don't know if you would have the answer to that question. So I I would have to double check uh, because I I actually did do I didn't process these samples myself. I am fairly confident that the samples that were being demonstrated in that second graph um, were of Canadian origin. Okay, thank you. I believe these were probably samples that are coming off of ships in Vancouver. Okay. In the interest of time, we're going to have to move on to the next speaker. Thank you so much for presenting to us. Great. I will hang out and I can answer any additional questions that come up in the Q&A. That'd be wonderful. All right. So up next, I'm excited to introduce uh, Philip Habrak and his presentation using the Inficos project to infer implications of monetary impacts of invasive alien species in Canada. Uh, Philip, uh, uh, feel free to uh, come on camera and share your screen, and I'll give a little bit of a preamble here as well. All right, so, so Philip Habrak obtained his PhD in ecology and ethology with a focus on invasion biology while attending the University of Florence, Ferrara, and Parma in Italy. Since then, he's worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of River Ecology and Conservation of the Senckenberg Research Institute in Gumhausen, Germany. His current research focuses on long-term trends in aquatic invasions, specifically the observable changes in community composition and functionality, how such functional changes are reflected within community stream quality assessment metrics, and how invasive species facilitate functional and biological homogenization. You can go ahead, Philip, whenever you're ready. Yes, let me show my screen quick. Okay, here we go. Um, can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Is it? Because it's all stuck here. Okay, now it should be ready, right? That looks great. Perfect. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Michael. Um, so I don't think I have to introduce myself now. So let's jump right back into the topic. So, as you might all know, biological invasions are a huge problem. And that's why we're basically here. 
The main problem, though, is that the frequency of invasions is increasing. And as two recently published papers by Hanno Sebens actually show, we're going to see very, very high rates of invasions in the near term future. So the question, which is basically in a room and nobody's going to answer, is at what cost do invasion come? One really intriguing aspect of invasions is the difficulty in synthesizing and assessing monetary impacts of invasive species as the services and the goods they affect are manifold. The good thing though is that money is a common language all around the world. It's our basic, our opportunity to address it and actually reach politicians. So this is basically the reason why Frank Chauchon, um, I'm, uh, who is also watching this presentation over YouTube, is uh, started the Invacos project uh, almost six, seven years ago, which basically aimed at synthesizing and summarizing the cost of invasive species all around the globe. Mm -hmm. so we basically created an updatable database, which gave us the opportunity to investigate and study, but also increase the awareness of biological invasions. In this way, we actually have a means and a tool to support efficient and cost-effective effective, decision-making, but also help stakeholders and governmental agencies to prioritize species which are invasive and might cause problems. We'll give you a small introduction to, to the, the time frame we're talking. When Frank and his co-workers started the database, it was 2014. The first version was finished in 2019 when we had a huge workshop in Paris and we sat together and we started to, to frame some topics, discuss in which direction we could go, which regions, what papers, and which species we could actually analyze first and, and how we would proceed. So this was a huge opportunity and I'm really thankful for Frank and to inviting me and all the others to, to start synthesizing the database and analyzing it together. And this is actually, as you can see, still ongoing. We're in 2022 now, and we are still developing database. It's a living database. It's still growing. There are almost over 13,000 cost entries from 907 species from 176 countries. I think this speaks for the huge amount of value this database can provide. Up to now, um, as you can see, we, we are actually still working on it. As I said, it's a living database, but most intriguing the time since uh, inception, we started 73 papers from which our 26 are still in progress, 13 are submitted and 34 ex actually accepted or published. One of the main flagship papers is actually the nature paper from Frank and Christoph, his um, recent postdoc, which synthesized the global cost of invasive species. As I was invited to speak here, the, the aim was to, to, to talk about Canada, but I thought I would give you a small introduction about North America first and then shift towards Canada. So for North America, we all know there's a famous paper from Pimentel in 2000, which was heavily criticized, but it reported a total of 137 billion per year in costs of invasive species. In terms of INVA cost, we used, I think it was version 4.0 for the recent paper which we published. And uh, we had about 5,000 entries. From these 5,000 entries, 3,000 were observed costs, and only a minor share of 1,000 entries was lowered by liability, meaning they were not peer reviewed and not in such a way that we wanted to present them. Synthesizing costs of highly reliable costs, which were actually observed and not potential, not extrapolated, and really observed costs, money that was actually spent or lost, we came to a total of 100. Uh, 1.2 trillion US dollar in the time between 1960 and 2017. Full data set, however, including also potential costs, amounted to over 3 trillion US dollars, which is a massive amount if you just think about it. Who wouldn't want to have such an amount on this bank account? But the real data set itself, just the costs which are really inferred, really happened, really occurred 100%, are over 1 trillion. This is a major pressure on economies. Breaking it down, we can use the Invacos database to investigate several aspects. For instance, we can look which taxonomic group had the major contributing costs. How were, were the costs damage costs or were they mostly management costs? Which sectors were, implemented, were impacted? Was it mostly agriculture, as in the case of, the, of, the, of North America? Or was it mostly environmental costs, which mostly, as you can imagine, are management costs? For North America in general, we, for instance, see that the uh, that rats were a major driver of costs. 
followed by cats, termites, red ants, and the boll weevil. Comparing North American countries, we can see that the US was a major contributor with over 6 billion in total costs, while Canada only contributed 2 billion at that point in time. But what about Canada? Um, what I did for this presentation, I basically opened the newest version, which is 4.1, which was released about a week ago, and pulled down all the entries which relate only to Canada. So not Canada and, and USA, only Canada. I found 140 entries, and after expanding them, which means basically that you give a cost per year, because some costs made my start in, in 2000, and they finished in 2010. So you have, after expansion, 10 entries. After all... Um, 306 were of high reliability, and the cost summed up to $89 billion. From these ones, observed costs were $78 billion, and the high reliable share, meaning observed costs, which came from peer-reviewed studies, amounted to $35 billion. I looked into, into the cost over time, and as you can see, the costs are increasing. This itself should be an indicator that something should be done to lower the cost, because the cost of uh, $35 million in just 10 years after 2011, considering the lack of reporting, is a massive amount, money which could be used otherwise in a more sensible way. Looking at the high reliability, this gap written reporting is even more obvious, as you can see the, 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 the decline after 2000. Still, looking at an average $560 million per year is a massive amount. In addition, I looked into damage costs and management costs. Um, I just realized I made a small mistake. Um, the damage cost should be um, the orange one at the, and on top, and the management would be the would be given. And you can see that the management cost is much lower than the damage cost. And as we all know, if you invest more into management, you can lower the damage cost. So here we can actually see that it is much room for improvement. The next looked into species. I just to give you an overview of the most species which are contributing costs. And some might guess which are leading. Are animals leading? Are fungi the most invasive, costly invasive species or plants? And surprise, it's pretty even between animals and plants, while fungi are close behind. In addition, we have diverse costs, which are not really groupable by economic group. They're either animals and plants, depending on the source. We looked into the sector, and I was actually surprised when I saw it, but I wouldn't have guessed that forestry and agriculture are almost evenly impacted. At the same time, environmental costs were pretty low, the same for fisheries. In terms of the environment, most costs impacted terrestrial environments, and only a minor share affected the semi-aquatic or the aquatic room. And as you can have seen before, the type of costs mostly damage costs. Here's the, po the point which made me uh, quite surprised. When I was reaching out to other colleagues who are also collaborating in Invercost, we realized that the number of invasive species which are in Canada are over the hundreds, but only 30 species are actually listed for Invercost in Canada. I mean, 30 of those 100 species are actually listed in Invercost. This case gives room for a higher, much higher cost, because considering that we have almost 500 U a million US dollars in per year in cost of invasive species, but we have only 30% of the species covered, should be worrisome to even the government. To sum up, in total, we have 90 billion costs, and from these 90 billion, 35 billion are really highly rival observed costs which occurred in the time between 1960 and 2017. These are massive, but still underestimated costs. Yet, we can determine some knowledge gaps. One of the major gaps is that we don't have data for all the species. This doesn't mean they don't exist, that the species don't have costs. It just means they haven't been investigated yet. They haven't been reported. This leads to an uneven reporting of species to, let's say, animals and plants, and neglecting for even fungi, or bacteria, or viruses even. At the same time, we see a huge drop in reported costs after 2010 which is something which might be uh, fixed in the next 10 years, but for now it gives room for much improvement. And to give you a last take home message, um, I want to add one point before. Invercost is a living database and everybody who's working this field know, who knows about 
recently published papers or is even working on cost of invasive species should submit the costs to Invercost. You can find the homepage uh, in the, on the slide when it will be published afterwards and help us develop this database because this effort is still ongoing and we're always looking for collaborators for new studies and, and more data. Um, this said, I think the psychometry is pretty clear. We have here the opportunity to use this database which includes massive amounts of information on the cost of racist species, which should be a clear message to politicians and governments and stakeholders to invest into management and early detection, rather than trying to manage invasive species at the goal when they are already established. This is especially true for Canada, but also for all other countries around the world. So that's it. I want to thank uh, Frank Shaw and all the Intercross team for making me part of this amazing group. And all of you for listening and um, the people from the Invasive Species Center for inviting me. Um, if you have questions, please ask. And I will also stick around for later afterwards if you have any further questions. Thank you so much, Philip. I, I definitely enjoyed that talk. Uh, we do have some questions rolling in. So the first one here is, does the costing that you've um, uh, presented here include invasive plants or just animals? I think this is beyond just the uh, breakdown by by different taxa. Yes, it, it includes every taxonomy. Even viruses and bacteria are in cost. If they're invasive, clearly not native to the region, they include it. Yes. Okay. If the data is available naturally. Of course, and, and I imagine that there must be a lot of data that could be out there that just hasn't been captured by yeah. this tool yet, right? Reports by the government, for instance, which are not easily accessible in many cases. Right. Okay. Is it possible to put a dollar value on the cost of doing nothing as a comparison? I could see this being valuable for a communication tool. I don't want to take away um, key messages of papers which are going to be submitted or published soon, but yes, I think we're going in this direction right now. Okay, great. I'm, I'm personally a little curious beyond the, um, the data that hasn't been captured yet. Is there anything further that can or should be done to ensure up the accuracy of some of these uh, broad estimates? Yes, I mean, the process is basically when we, when we did, for instance, the, the paper on Europe, we looked at the costs and we, we estimated, the, we did the first analysis to get some feeling for the data. And we, we identified several overlaps, for instance, between the cost entries. We also found that some, some entries in the database were the same, just reported by different papers. So there's always some double checking, some back and forth to determine if the, speed, the, the cost entries are really relevant. At the same time, um, whenever we start a new project, we're doing the same procedure. We're checking each cost entry to ensure that we don't have an over-reporting of single entries. So I know that um, I think one of the first slides you showed was um, kind of a projection for expected costs down the road. And I'm wondering um, if you can just talk to a little bit, a little bit more about that modeling process, whether that's been um, conducted in specific jurisdictions or, or what is that process like? Um, in, the, in the first slides, I showed um, a plot from Sebens et al. 2017, which shows the incline in species being invasive in, in certain regions. So it, it shows that the number of invasive species is increasing and going to increase in the near future. We're talking next 20, 30 years. And if you assume an increase of, of 30 to 40% in invasive species, you can assume that the cost is exponentially higher because those species are not going to stick to one area. They will actually spread. So the cost will be increasing much faster. Right. Yeah, I would expect that like, if you are modeling things, you have to consider that there's, uh, there's more impacts per species and there's more species as well, right? Exactly, so you're yes. kind of getting and hit on Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, are there any complications with the modeling process or is it just a matter of um, you know, that being applied in uh, communication? What I actually showed you was just the, uh, the average cost per decade and used to, to analyze the cost per year and to show a trend. But the Invercost package, one of our members, one of the founding members, Boris Leroy, he actually published the Invercost R package, which is freely available. It has the newest version of the database freely in it. And it has implemented modeling tools, which can be used to estimate the costs in the, in the most recent years, for instance. But we're also working on modeling and extrapolation techniques to, to look deeper into the trends of costs, yes. We actually okay. recently published a paper on the relationship between costs and the reporting of costs, which is highly interesting in this regard. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Philip. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move along to our next speaker as well. 
I just wanted our audience to know that IC hosted a webinar uh, about Invacost 3.0, and that can be found on IC's website under the Learn Slash Webinar Series, and it can be found on our YouTube page as well. So if you are interested in some of Philip's work and some of the, the underlying data there, um, there's more that you can explore there. Yes, IC no hosts... We're a living group, we're open for collaboration, just reach out to us. Thanks. That's great. Um, just a further plug of some of IAC's work as well. We do host a webinar series regularly. So the Invacost webinar was a part of this one. We try to do one about monthly and we try to feature experts in the field of invasive species management, prevention and monitoring to discuss different topics. You can learn more about this on our website as well. So up next, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Sarah Rang, who's gonna speak on the Green Shovels Collaborative and Fragmites Cost-Benefit Analysis. So Sarah, if you want to share your screen, I'll give a little bit of a description of your background here. So Sarah is the Executive Director of the nonprofit Invasive Species Center, whose mission is to protect Canada's land and water from invasive species. Sarah has 30 years of experience in conservation policy and programs. She has worked with a diverse range of partners to help create new environmental initiatives, including a $1.5 million annual community grant program. She's worked with indigenous communities and government to develop an $85 million trust fund for environmental remediation. And she's worked with provincial and federal governments on joint Great Lakes projects. Sarah holds a master's of science from the University of Toronto. And with that, the floor is yours, Sarah. Uh, thanks, Mike, and thanks everyone for joining uh, for this session. I'm going to give a little bit of an update of some work from our Green Shovels Collaborative, uh, building a case for investment in Pragmites in Ontario. Um, I'm doing the presenting today, but it really is a collaborative effort based on work from the ISC team and the Green Shovels Collaborative. Uh, in case you're not familiar with Invasive Species Centre, um, we're a nonprofit group headquartered in Sault Ste. Marie and uh, welcome your visit anytime, uh, hopefully soon in the future. Uh, a little bit of a background on the Green Shovels Collaborative. Uh, we are a group of organizations that share an interest in invasive species. Uh, we've got together about a year and a half ago um, to really do a collective impact through collaboration. We want to acknowledge the funding from the Ministry of no uh, Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry to the Green Shovels Collaborative, which has really made all these efforts possible. Uh, we've chosen to work a, a little bit on a, a common problem in Ontario and across Canada uh, called Phragmites. Uh, it's common read. It, this is a uh, grows large and in these big monocultures and takes over wetlands. Uh, Phragmites is everywhere. Um, it's probably, you've seen it along, if you've been driving along any of the 400 series highways in Ontario, but it is a problem really throughout the Great Lakes Basin and, and uh, in other areas as well. Um, it's a problem um, because it really impacts all different sectors. It has ecological impacts, which if uh, you're a biologist, you tend to focus on um, known impacts in terms of 25% of Ontario species at risk, and also a big role in terms of hydrology, nutrient cycling, uh, water quality, uh, and decomposition. Uh, it, you, if you work in the municipal field, you tend to think of it from the infrastructure and public safety viewpoint, um, because it grows in the ditch, it can Im impact your sight lying along your road. Um, if you're a farmer, you're worried about it clogging up your agricultural drains and ditches and, and reducing some of your crop yield. Um, it also can uh, go right through sort of pavement on the side of the shoulders and therefore change some of your maintenance schedules on your, on your highways as well. Um, agriculture, um, it is a big problem in, in many of different fields, especially in southwest Ontario, where they have a lot of tile drainage um, and are seeing a lot of flooding, um, either flooding or drought uh, reduce yield. Um, if you have, if you're fortunate enough to share any time in terms of along the many beautiful lakes in Ontario, uh, you might have come across it. It is a problem in terms of reducing some of the aesthetics, the vistas, the lake views. Um, it is also a problem if you're a hunter or a fisher um, and uh, enjoy the sort of being out on the water as well. So a large amount of socioeconomic impacts. 
And we're just beginning to work with some partners in terms of uh, loss of traditional medicines and the ability for Phragmites to actually take over and crowd out historical and cultural sites. Um, at, at the Green Shovels Collaborative, we're really working on these two main baskets, and I'm just going to speak today to the first one, the Phragmites strategy. Um, the information is available on our microsite, the greenshovels.ca. Today, just going to walk you briefly through four uh, updates that we're doing under the Phragmites part of the Green Shovels project. Um, the first one is a strategic framework for the coordinated management of invasive frag in Ontario. And this work is led by our colleagues at uh, Nature Conservancy of Canada and the Invasive Phragmites Control Centre. Um, and it really is geared towards trying to work together to develop a long-term framework for frag management in Ontario, um, doing both a coordinated uh, province-wide look as well as regional implementation plans. Um, I'm not going to speak very much to this. Uh, tune in tomorrow at uh, 11.20, uh, where our colleague uh, Eric Cleland will uh, speak to this matter and, and walk you through the coordinated framework. Uh, we've also um, been delighted to be able to offer uh, an invasive uh, Phragmites control fund. Um, so at the Invasive Species Centre, we have been supporting uh, local groups across Ontario, uh, over 20, a whole series of really innovative projects um, across the province. Uh, we really wanted to be able to provide support to the incredible volunteer local efforts that are happening across Ontario um, as a way of really strengthening our management of Phragmites. And uh, we're just in the process of starting up a new DNA screening service program. Um, and this is in conjunction uh, with Trent University. Uh, what we're seeing a lot in, and many of you who manage Phragmites have, have, may have noticed this, uh, but native Phragmites is increasingly observed with more dominant characteristics in Ontario. So it used to be um, not easy, but possible to, to tell native Phrag from invasive Phrag by certain kind of characteristics um, that are outlined here. Um, it's getting, many people are finding it's, it's getting increasingly difficult to tell native uh, Phragmites from invasive Phrag. And that, of course, is a, a really important step in terms of controlling and managing Phragmites in Ontario. Um, it, there isn't evidence yet of um, native and invasive uh, frag hybridizing, um, but just the caveat that it doesn't mean it isn't hybridizing and it, it doesn't mean that it won't happen in the future. Um, so we're delighted to be able to offer a new service uh, to land managers working on Phragmites uh, to uh, offer a DNA screening service to be able to tell native frag from invasive frag. And so uh, really focus our efforts uh, where we need to be on the invasive frag. Um, so we will be uh, developing about 20 community science kits and instructions on how to collect uh, samples for uh, invasive or native Phragmites, and we'll be able to send you back an answer as to yes, it is native or yes, it is invasive. Um, so uh, please see greenshovels.ca if you're interested in this program, we'll be starting the sign up in, uh, this month. Wanted to focus really on the cost benefit analysis for Phragmites, and this is a, a, a project that's led by the Invasive Species Centre with many different partners, and including Dr. Richard uh, uh, Vine from the University of Guelph. So why do a cost benefit analysis of FRAG? Uh, it really relates to some of the comments that we've heard in the previous uh, sessions. Um, we uh, got together with many partners uh, because this is uh, to develop really one of the first uh, cost benefit analysis of FRAG in Ontario. We really need this information to be able to build the case for investment in FRAG um, at the local uh, level, as well as all different orders of, of government. Um, and we're really interested in, in using some of this information to build new innovative funding mechanisms, which our, our colleagues will speak to in the next session. Um, so this uh, preliminary analysis, again, is available uh, to you to read and welcome your comments. Uh, what we first did was we estimated the cost of control. And even though that sounds simple, it's actually uh, not. It's uh, hard to know exactly the area that Phragmites is taking in Ontario. Uh, we had to make several simplifying assumptions, you know, that the entire area could be treated in the first year. 
And uh, we, we uh, noticed that roads are mainly con controlled using one kind of method and wetlands were controlled using the sort of cut to drown kind of methods. Uh, these are our results. Um, you'll see that the cost actually changed depending on where Phragmites is. Uh, it's harder to reach and treat uh, Phragmites in wetland and hence the higher cost in terms of uh, treating uh, uh, Phragmites in those wetlands. So overall, the costs are, you know, range from about 90 million to $113 million uh, to control Phragmites. We then took a look at the benefits of control and the economic benefits are measured by the sum of the avoided cost of damage. And again, estimating the cost of damages is, is really a challenging uh, and a dynamic field in itself. We looked at eight different sectors that are listed here in order to provide a, a sense of what the benefits of frag control could be. And here are our results. Um, we broke it down by sector on the left-hand side, a description of the individual impacts, which we quantified. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the actual um, estimates in terms of the benefits. And you'll notice that many of them are annual. Uh, there is one that is a one-time benefit, and that is the property value um, reduced aesthetic appeal for the waterfront properties. And that is a, a big number, a $350 million number um, that uh, is one of the estimates of the benefits of control. So uh, this gives you a sense of uh, where the different categories are and where the different uh, benefits lie. Uh, we recognize that the study being one of the first one, it has a uh, limitation of the gaps. And so we welcome your assistance uh, in filling some of these gaps. Uh, and these are some of the areas that uh, we feel that we could uh, benefit from comments from anyone in the audience in terms of increasing our understanding of, of these uh, areas uh, here, especially uh, were identified as key and critical areas. Um, to do that, uh, we're hosting a spring workshop with many partners to review the cost and benefit analysis, um, roll up our sleeves, go through it in a lot of detail, really welcome your participation in this and our opportunity to further refine the cost benefit analysis. Uh, we can then all use the cost benefit analysis in our individual work, either at the local level or the regional or provincial or even the Canada wide level. Um, if you're interested, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us or sign up on our website and you'll receive invitations to all ISC events. Um, just wanted to really close there, welcome your comments and wanted to thank you to all our partners which are listed here. It's a joint uh, effort uh, with many different people who are highly knowledgeable about Phragmites in Ontario. So wanted to turn it back to you, Mike, uh, and see if there's any questions. Yes, thank you for that talk, Sarah. Um, big thank you to everyone involved in the Green Shovels Collaborative. I know that it's been no easy feat on our part to um, get everyone kind of aligned as far as goals. And um, now that we have got this uh, clear direction we can go with it, um, I'm very excited to see where it will go. So we do have some questions. Um, the first one here is, can Phragmites be used for anything beneficial, such as biofuels? Um, and might this help offset management costs? Uh, it would be great um, if that were sort of um, economically available right now. Uh, there is some work certainly in terms of using a variety of grasses as biofuels or biomass. Um, it's not, um, I would say it's at the beginning stages. It's not really um, commercially viable stages yet in Ontario, but certainly in other areas of the world, there is that opportunity and potential. So um, if there was some potential to be able to use Phragmites um, for biomass, um, that might, that would certainly be helpful in terms of being able to provide some economic um, stimulus to actually control it. Um, many people have mixed minds uh, on this issue in terms of the ability to use invasives for commercial purposes. So I recognize there's lots of different thinking about it, um, but certainly um, right now uh, it's not a commercially, um, it's not in commercial use uh, in Ontario. That's fair. 
Um, there's a question kind of related to this. So I just want you to clarify if you can, is this something the Green Shovels Collaborative is looking into or are we simply receptive to uh, opportunities to commercialize it? Uh, we'd certainly welcome anyone in the audience who has any thoughts on commercialization, you know, please get in touch with us. We'd welcome a conversation about it and, uh, um, you know, happy to, uh, happy to have that discussion. Great. The question specifically was about whether biochar could be something to be looked at. So I don't know if, if anyone in our audience is interested in pursuing that. Um, sounds like Sarah's receptive to it. Yeah, please just shoot me uh, your email in the in the chat and I'll get in touch with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, one question I have specifically is um, as far as finding the methods uh, to um, pair those with the most appropriate uh, Fragmites patches, is there a lot of wiggle room and opportunity to innovate as far as methods for control? Um, yeah, there's lots of different methods of control, and there's um, lots of people who are highly knowledgeable about this in terms of matching, um, you know, the specific location and end use and objectives to the actual method. And across Ontario, you'll see, you know, generally quite different methods of control in different areas. Um, and there's a number of different groups who can really provide uh, expert assistance here. So if you would like uh, to learn more, again, just get in touch with us and, and we'll connect you uh, to different folks. Great. So another question here, are there any resources for land managers such as organizations mentioned or municipalities to find licensed local contractors or operators that have experience with Fragmites? Uh, I guess two suggestions. One is the really great um, best management practice guide for Phragmites, which has been uh, put out by the Ontario Invasive Plant Council and other uh, groups as well. So I would start there. That gives you a really good overview of the management practices for FRAG and uh, the most recent updated version is there. Um, there are organizations that do maintain uh, lists of eligible contractors, mainly more in the US through um, some of the Great Lakes Commission, wonderful work on Pragmites as well. Um, so that would be another kind of resource for you as well. Okay. One final question here. Are there any opportunities for biocontrol of Frag? Uh, yes, there are a number of groups who are working on biocontrol of FRAG um, as well. And um, as you know, biocontrol uh, methods go through a, a very distinct process in terms of uh, making sure that they're effective and safe. Um, so they are in sort of the middle to end part of that process. Um, and uh, there are a number of different groups involved in biocontrol uh, for FRAG. Um, so we will uh, hopefully shortly be knowing whether it is effective and can work as a potential solution to FRAG. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, again, we're going to move on. Thank you so much for your time, Sarah. Uh, no problem. Yeah. Okay. As a note to our audience, I would encourage you to check out greenshovels.ca for more information on the Green Shovels Collaborative that Sarah just talked about. Um, Additionally, ISC maintains three publicly accessible, searchable databases on our website. You can check out our risk assessment and pathway risk assessment databases and our best management practices databases at invasivespeciescenter.ca. So to close off this session, we have two final speakers, Mike Pisker and Ben Cohen. They're gonna speak on an innovative approach to protect the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River from invasive species. Um, so Mike, if you want to share your screen and I'll give a little uh, description of both yours and Ben's background here. Okay. All right, so Mike manages the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers, the GSGP Aquatic Invasive Species Program and he oversaw development of the Governors and Premiers Least Wanted List and Mutual Aid Agreement. He also leads development of the Great Lakes Impact Investment Platform, which is designed to encourage uh, projects that use innovative financing to deliver demonstrable environmental benefits. Mike has previously managed the GSGP's Maritime Transportation and Water Use Data Initiatives. Ben is the Director of Quantified Ventures, which is a conservation finance firm that specializes in structuring outcomes-based approaches to fund environmental projects. 
Ben heads the urban and coastal resilience practice, leading innovative transactions to manage stormwater, to mitigate flood and droughts, and to prepare for disasters. Ben has also worked across other practice areas on projects addressing invasive species management, salmonid habitat restoration, wildlife risk reduction, and reforestation. Please lead us off, Mike. All right, thank you, Mike. Appreciate the intro and the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm Mike Pisker with the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers. Um, as you know, I'm doing this presentation jointly with Ben Cohen, so I'm going to move fairly quickly through my slides to make sure Ben has enough time to talk about our project. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about um, our work organizationally generally on AIS and how it kind of fits together into the project we've been working on with Quantified Ventures and the Invasive Species Center. So just by way of background, uh, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers is a partnership of the eight U.S. states and the Canadian provinces of Ontario and Quebec uh, in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence region. We work on a broad range of issues from water management to international trade promotion, uh, impact investment, and of course, aquatic invasive species. And uh, as you see, the, the mission is growing the region's six trillion dollar economy and protecting the world's greatest freshwater system. So I'm sure a map like this has been shown multiple times already uh, in this conference, but just to give you know a little context, uh, the Great Lakes with about 20% of the world's surface freshwater uh, have a major uh, invasive species problem. There's about 180 uh, AIS already present in the lakes. Uh, this has huge repercussions for commercial, recreational uses, uh, obviously ecological impacts as well. And then from an uh, economic standpoint, uh, hugely straining of budgets in the states and the provinces, federal governments and others. So our work on invasive species, especially in probably the last five to 10 years, has really focused kind of in two major themes. Number one is priority action against the highest risk species, and then really kind of thinking uh, outside the box and bringing some innovative approaches to dealing with some of these issues. So um, in 2013, the governors and premiers created a least wanted list, and this basically identified uh, those highest risk species that presented a clear threat of invasion into the region and really said, we're going to target these for priority action. So we worked with the uh, experts from the states and provinces in the region, initially identified 16 species. That list grew to 21 uh, over time. And as you see, this has led to more than 60, uh, nearly 60 separate actions taken by the states and provinces. For example, I have to give a shout out to the province of Ontario, which has taken action against all 21 of the species uh, on the list. Four of those species were uh, prohibited under federal law in the US. And this is one, even though it was done several years ago, we continue to have progress made on it every year. Uh, and that number of different um, actions taken by the states and provinces continues to tick upward. Uh, and this is a complete list. So as you see, it covers fish, including the invasive carp species, uh, plants and invertebrates, so, uh, you know, again, really trying to be comprehensive here, really letting, trying to let the science and risk assessment uh, drive the decision making. Uh, another component to the work we've done is a mutual aid agreement. This was a partnership among the governors and the premiers designed uh, really, as you see here, preventing the introduction and spread of AIS, fostering mutual aid in the region, and then um, encouraging further cooperative actions. This came out of the time when eDNA for the invasive carp was first starting to show up in the region. And it really created some practical problems of in the event of a kind of multi-state or province um, interaction, what are some of the really practical problems came to the fore in terms of sharing of resources, sharing of, of people, recognizing licenses and certifications, usage of chemicals. Uh, and it quickly became sort of a, a very complicated legal environment so the idea here was to get ahead of it and say, hey, if there is a serious threat, if, if, for example, Ontario has a problem and they need help from Michigan or another state or whomever in the region, what are these barriers that we know exist and what can we do to take care of them proactively? Uh, so again, this was developed several years ago and over the intervening time, we've taken a lot of effort to kind of keep it as a living document, ensuring that it's staying uh, fresh and staying uh, responsive to the needs of the time. Uh, part of that is through joint response exercises, uh, several of which took place on the water in recent years. Uh, of course, that's become more challenging in COVID times, but last spring in May uh, through the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, we did hold a virtual tabletop exercise that was focused on invasive carp. So another kind of piece of the puzzle here in terms of trying to protect the region from the highest risk species. 
The kind of third piece of this is law enforcement. Uh, so we had the, the other two parts I talked about, and this really was coming at it. Um, literally, we sat down with law enforcement officials throughout the states and provinces working through the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and said, what do you need? What would be most helpful to you to be able to do your job uh, in terms of wildlife and, and AIS violations? So um, this MOU on regional cooperative enforcement operations kind of came to the forefront. This is basically a, 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 a cooperation among the states and provinces. It started first with the two federal agencies you see at the bottom there in the US and Canada, as well as the states of Ontario, uh, excuse me, the province of Ontario, the states of New York and Michigan. It was expanded to include all of the Great Lakes states and provinces. And this is really about cross-border investigations, sharing of resources in the event of a law enforcement action. So really kind of the logical next step out of the last two pieces I talked about and really helped to, to keep the region as, as kind of secure as possible against invasion from uh, new AIS. So the last piece I wanna talk about, and this uh, follows from Sarah's comments and leads into what Ben's gonna talk about. And this was really starting to think uh, again, kind of innovatively about how do we deal with some of the uh, AIS that are already present? So we heard about Phragmites from Sarah why it's a huge issue, why it has these major ecological and environmental impacts, and what can we do to, to bring some, not just new thinking to it, but new resources as well, recognizing it's hugely expensive um, and, and really requires some, some different ways to think about how to, how to lead it going forward. So we've been really fortunate to work with an outstanding group, including the Invasive Species Center, Quantified Ventures, Nature Conservancy of Canada, bringing really a diversity of expertise and thinking about how can we develop a long-term uh, landscape and regional level management program that's focused uh, on prevention in the first instance and eradication where possible. We settled on Phragmites in Ontario as sort of the test case, but recognizing that if this works, it has applicability to other species and other parts of the region, of course. So it'll, uh, the idea is an outcomes-based financing structure, uh, which Ben is gonna talk about in more detail, but we're really excited about this. We've been at this project for a little over a year now and have, ma have made some great progress. So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn it over to Ben Cohen from Quantified Ventures, uh, who's gonna talk about this project in more detail. Great, thanks, Mike. I'm just gonna pull my screen up. Okay, hopefully everybody can see this. Um, so, you know, uh, just to you know, further reiterate um, that this project that uh, Mike and I and his other colleagues at GSGP, as well as uh, the Invasive Species Center and Nature Conservancy Canada have been working on, um, have been uh, to, you know, really evaluate what a large landscape scale, regional scale um, management program for Phragmites might look like in Ontario as well as what the accompanying uh, funding or financing framework could be to support that, um, that will foster the province's goal of becoming frag-free by 2033. So, um, you know, our work is to, you know, first um, identify, you know, what an optimal program might look like in terms of eradication as well as prevention, um, including uh, key geographies to target for program implementation and, and what the interventions are. Um, and then leverage the cost benefit uh, that has been you know, started already through the Green Shovels work uh, that Sarah presented on um, to you know, be able to create a, a creative, collaborative uh, outcomes-based funding and financing strategy to be able to support the work. And uh, just to put a finer point on, on what we're talking about, when we're talking about outcomes-based financing, um, you know, we've heard a, a lot in, in this session today from Philip and from Sarah around the impacts of invasive species like Phragmites, um, the costs that they uh, incur on economies and on ecosystems. Um, you know, but we recognize that when we're talking about those kinds of costs and benefits, um, even though you know, we know that uh, the benefits of management um, you know, greatly outweigh the costs of management, um, and can greatly outweigh the, the cost of uh, that invasive species incur through a business as usual kind of approach if nothing is done. Um, these benefits in terms of avoided costs uh, and, and other ecosystem benefits are, are greatly diffused across a number of different uh, stakeholders and types of benefits. Um, you know, when we're looking at Phragmites in Ontario, we're looking at property values, property tax revenues, 
um, you know, the potential to increase tourism and recreation if these populations are under control, um, improving road and traffic safety, reducing fire risk and, and risk of power outages, improving stormwater management and habitat and biodiversity, uh, increasing agricultural production, uh, the provision of other ecosystem services, as well as insurance benefits. Um, we know that there's a number of different benefits that can greatly outweigh the cost of a Phragmites management program. But currently, you know, there, there doesn't exist any kind of financing or funding framework to actually be able to capitalize on these benefits and convert, you know, what we know and what we see in the, in the kinds of studies that, that Philip is compiling um, around, you know, the, the, the cost of, of these uh, invasive species populations. Uh, there doesn't really exist a way to actually convert those kinds of economic benefits into real dollars that are going to support work on the ground uh, to actually manage these populations. Um, so our approach uh, at Quantified Ventures is to be, you know, looking at these types of benefits holistically um, and then come up with a, a funding or financing framework that leverages what we know about the, the value, the economic value of these types of benefits of, of Phragmites and other invasive species management um, to be able to translate into real dollars going uh, in the ground. And uh, we'll get into you know, what that can look like, but it's essentially finding ways to you know, bring beneficiaries and stakeholders together, look at where existing funding or financing resources already uh, exist at the local, uh, provincial or state and federal level, um, as well as through philanthropy and the private sector um, to be able to you know, come up with a large scale treatment program um, that can really uh, and meaningfully um, impact uh, the, the control of Phragmites populations across the province. Um, and so when we're talking about outcomes-based financing, this is just a, 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 di a, a diagram of you know, the conservation finance world in general. And then in this light blue are you know, the key uh, add-ons that are brought by this outcomes-based financing approach. Um, it's essentially you know, leveraging a third party verification and reporting in the middle here, you know, being able to evaluate um, how many hectares were actually, you know, uh, were actually treated and, you know, how many years are those areas, um, you know, not seeing any uh, new growth or repopulation of Phragmites populations or, um, you know, what can we demonstrate in terms of uh, reduced uh, road or, or traffic safety incidents um, and, you know, finding ways to actually measure the success of these programs that can A, um, tie uh, repayment terms uh, of any investment in such a large scale management program um, to that evaluation, which ensures that, you know, if you're a public entity that's issuing a green bond, for example, um, it can offer a way to, you know, tie your repayment back to investors um, based on that evaluation of, of the, the success of the program. Um, it can also be a way to, you know, generate new revenues by structuring outcomes-based contracts um, with uh, beneficiaries who, you know, care about uh, invasive species management, who care about Phragmites and the impact it has on them, um, but by offering, you know, a way and a contract mechanism to uh, enable them to pay um, based on, you know, a per hectare controlled basis, for example, um, it, it, enables, uh, it enables them to pay based on, you know, a, a portion of the expected economic value that they would receive from effectively controlling and managing uh, these Phragmites populations in Ontario, um, in addition to you know, leveraging public funds, private revenues, uh, sales of environmental credits that can also be used to support uh, repayment of, invest of investment in a large scale uh, landscape scale treatment program. Um, so, you know, again, to you know, uh, describe the, the work that we're doing is to you know, develop a multi-year landscape and regional scale, a level integrated Phragmites management program um, that would be enabled by this collaborative outcomes-based financing structure. Um, it offers a way to, you know, structure contracts, again, with beneficiaries at, at the local, provincial, uh, and federal and private sector levels um, to pay based on the outcomes they care about. Um, the idea here is that, you know, we know that uh, this, this work can benefit a number of different beneficiaries, but, you know, individual uh, municipal governments, for example, even if they're already doing some uh, individual um, fragmented management in particular locations, 
Um, you know, no one entity alone has the resources to pay for the management work that is needed, <clears throat> needed at a regional or provincial scale to uh, really meaningfully and effectively control uh, Phragmites across the province. Um, but by, you know, building a collaborative framework where, again, uh, you know, these local entities uh, can, you know, participate by uh, paying based on the outcomes that they care about or by sharing other funding or financing resources, it ensures that the financial burden doesn't fall on any one entity alone. At the same time, it can enable a much larger scale than the individual um, management programs that are already underway uh, across the province, um, which can then lead to uh, economies of scale when it comes to uh, the, the cost of treatment and management, as well as uh, the, uh, the expected benefits, you know, if there's one municipality um, that is, you know, treating the Phragmites population in, in its area, but, you know, adjacent areas are not also effectively managed, it can, you know, lead to uh, a higher likelihood that um, Phragmites can simply repopulate in that area again, um, and therefore long-term maintenance costs will be higher over time. Whereas, you know, if we look at a, a regional scale perspective and how do we effectively manage this plant across the province or across a particular region, um, it can ensure that, you know, long-term maintenance costs um, might be a, a little bit less if we're, you know, actively preventing the likelihood of, of spread and repopulation. So there's a number of different benefits that we're looking at. As Mike said, you know, we've been working on this for a year. Our first uh, uh, phase of, the, of this program was, you know, looking at a couple of different uh, invasive species. Ultimately, we decided on Phragmites based on a lot of what Sarah and Mike have talked about in terms of the, the impact to the province. Um, we're working now to leverage a lot of the cost benefit analysis and work that's been done already to um, initiate conversations uh, with stakeholders uh, across a range of different uh, sectors and levels of government um, to sort of pitch this idea, get a sense of what they care about in terms of uh, invasive Phragmites management um, and as well as, you know, better understand how public financing mechanisms work and what resources are available in Ontario that can support uh, this outcomes-based financing and funding framework to support a large-scale invasive Phragmites management program. Um, so with that, um, I know our context will be shared, but happy to uh, address any, any questions uh, in this session as well. Okay, thank you both so much. Um, we do have some questions rolling in from the audience. There seems to be a lot of interest in this, uh, this tool. So in prevention, has there been any considerations of more active restoration strategies like seed mixes to prevent reinvasion? So they go on further to say that active restoration is more expensive, but is it more effective and therefore more cost effective potentially too? I might pass that question to Sarah if she's still... Um available to, to address. You're on mute, Sarah. <laughs> I thought maybe I'd go through one Zoom session without that, but there we go. Um, yeah, great question. Um, I think it's always helpful to kind of look at two sides of the coin, you know, removal of invasive species and encouragement of native species. So uh, very much um, a big proponent of uh, using sort of uh, restoration techniques after uh, techniques to remove invasives. And one of them um, is the seed mix kind of thing. And I know it's been used quite uh, successfully in some areas as well. Um, in the sort of costing, the cost benefit analysis, it, it really is just focused in terms of the cost of re removal of Phragmites. Um, but I think you make a good point and one that we could uh, address maybe at our spring workshop is, would it be useful to add on that restoration element as well in terms of, of the Phragmites program? So uh, thank you for your question. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I do have a question just as far as the process of getting stakeholder buy-in. Um, I, I would personally expect that that might be one of the more challenging or time-consuming parts of the project. Is there any precedent to suggest that perhaps it is simpler than I'm assuming it is from uh, similar financial tools? So in terms of stakeholder engagement, uh, you saw we, we've con been conducting a webinar series over the past few months, um, speaking with representatives from municipal uh, provincial and federal government, as well as the private sector. And, you know, I think it's, it can be difficult to, you know, access everybody who cares about it. But, you know, I think through the right channels, 
um, you know, we've, we've proven uh, effective before in other projects that we've worked in and, you know, being able to get these, uh, you know, different parties, different entities together and recognizing the shared benefits of this type of work and committing to funding structures. For example, um, we've worked in Ohio around out, outdoor recreation infrastructure. And we've successfully brought a city and a county government together there to form a new council of governments that you know, has enhanced their competitiveness for state and federal grants to support that work. Uh, we're working in Southwest Colorado um, on wildfire risk reduction and you know, working both at across a number of different county and city governments, as well as the state government and the, the National Forest Service. Uh, in the U.S. Uh, and, you know, working with local partners uh, through a local Firewise chapter who, you know, regularly are, are, are interacting with individual uh, landowners, property owners um, on, you know, ways that they could participate and, you know, uh, sort of convincing them to enroll in a program that will uh, reduce uh, risk of wildfire across the region and, you know, coming up with the right kind of uh, financial incentives to, you know, ensure that, you know, Perhaps they can contribute some some funding to do that, but that it it's, uh, represents a small share of the expected uh, benefit that they would receive um, in terms of, of risk reduction. And so, you know, I think having the right partners and having the right channels to do that can effectively, um, you know, uh, uh, form these these new stakeholder uh, kinds of groups and collaboratives to support this kind of work. And, and where I'm going with this specifically is that um, some stakeholders will have like a you know, less, uh, less, less uh, complications as far as land access um, and might be privy to um, larger chunks of land with fragmenties on it. There's a question in the audience here about the challenge of addressing small dispersed infestation points for fragmenties and whether you can touch a little bit further on um, addressing the challenge of dealing with individual small, uh, smaller landowners. Yeah, and again, I think that's where, you know, having the right, the right kinds of partners uh, on the ground, uh, it becomes important. And, you know, when we're thinking about the beneficiaries and the stakeholders who are involved, you know, we're also thinking about um, cottagers associations and, and other groups that, you know, have relationships with individual landowners so that, you know, we can ensure that we're, we're going beyond, uh, you know, public lands to access, you know, small individual private parcels that, you know, could be really key from a, from a Fragmites management perspective um, to address the, the issue. Okay, uh, one final question here in the audience. Are you using biodiversity financing, Biofin, as an approach in the financing of AIS control and management? So I'm not familiar with, with Biofin, but you know we've been paying attention to the framework around uh, species at risk um, in Ontario and in Canada at large as you know potentially enabling new, new markets or, or credits or um, ways to provide additional funding to be able to, to support this work. Um, you know, by leveraging uh, some of the, the biodiversity or enhanced biodiversity benefits that come with, you know, effectively managing uh, Phragmites populations, invasive Phragmites populations. Yeah, I, I personally wonder if um, a lot of that's captured in the ecosystem services that you touched on there. Okay, uh, I think we're going to wrap things up. Thank you, uh, Ben and Mike. Um, I just wanna express uh, thank you to all of our speakers. That concludes our sessions for the morning. If you've missed any of today's sessions, the recordings will be available after the event on ISC's YouTube channel. We're gonna break for lunch right now. We're gonna resume at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our, next, uh, for our first keynote speaker, Dr. Brian Leung, who's talking about current research on how predictive ecology can inform management decisions. And I hope to see you all there. Thank you, Mike, for a great session. Uh, as he mentioned, we'll we'll return back at 1 p.m. for our first keynote speaker of the conference. So we're looking forward to that. <laughs>